Hello, everyone. My name is Lionel Sander from Pembroke Publishers, and thanks for joining us this evening or this afternoon, depending where you are uh, in this country. Just before we get started, I would like you to know that Pembroke Publishers' head office is situated upon traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of Scugog, Hiawatha First Nation, Alderville First Nation, and the Métis Nation. The treaty covering this area of land in Toronto, Ontario is collectively known as the Williams Treaties of 1923. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Wasanic people on whose traditional territory I live, learn and work. The Wasanic people have lived and worked on this land since time immemorial. I wish to recognize the significant contributions of Indigenous peoples across this land. We seek a new relationship with First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, one based in honour, and deep respect. And now it's my uh, privilege to uh, to welcome our our speaker for this evening. And uh, as I mentioned in the in the preamble before we got started, uh, David lives on the the wonderful island of Prince Edward, the only province I have not visited. And uh, we share a kinship in that I live on another island, just happens to be on the west coast uh, and called Vancouver Island. So uh, it's the island boys here today to, uh, uh, from Pembroke Publishers uh, doing the presentation. Uh, if you are a Twitter fan, we'd love for you to tweet out during the session. Uh, you'll notice in the chat there's a public and then right beside the tab a Twitter tab. And if you click on the Twitter tab, you'll see uh, it, anyone that, that tweets out to Pembroke webinars, uh, that particular tweet will be grabbed and put into there. And so if you see something that's uh, that speaks to you and you support, please feel free to add that into the Twitter stream. We'd love for you to do that. So uh, this chat will also be moderated. And then at the end, I'll provide uh, any questions that come from the group to our presenter. And we'll have a, a brief conversation at the end and try to bring as many of those questions as I can forward. So please feel free to put any questions in there and I'll make sure that uh, they're brought forward at the end. And so with that, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. David Costello. Uh, David is an author and a professional learning facilitator who focuses on mathematics, instruction, and learning. Uh, he is not, as far as I know, a 23-year veteran of the NHL, but I may stand to be to be corrected. Um, he's a, but he is a classroom teacher and administrator based in uh, Prince Edward Island. And he has supported many teachers in many roles, including as a numeracy interventionist, a numeracy coach, a numeracy leader, and a curriculum consultant. He's a popular speaker at conferences, and uh, hopefully one day we can all be together to hear him speak at a, at a math conference in your province. Uh, but he has also uh, instructed numerous university courses on curriculum, differentiation, mathematics, and literacy. David is committed to transforming math instruction and creating more meaningful learning experiences for teachers and students. And for those of you that have been to other webinars before, I think it's pretty safe to say one of the takeaways that we uh, that I've had from those sessions is that all, all of our Pembroke authors are passionate about learning and they're passionate about uh, making the teachers' jobs easier and giving them ideas to take forward in their classroom. And I know David's going to be doing the same today. And so. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce and uh, pass the virtual mic over to uh, our math fanatic for the next hour or so, Dr. David Costello. Okay, everyone, thank you. Um, now, now I wonder how many people were sitting back when we couldn't get the microphone working thinking, sweet mother of pearl, this is a sign, let it go. Just let it go, we'll smile, we'll nod, we'll say we tried, um, but you know, if it wasn't meant to be. But um, I'm glad everything's working. Um, like uh, Lionel said, um, um, I have Wi-Fi where I live in PEI. Um, just to give you context, I think the most traffic we have going by um, our house, our docks right now, we had a dock last night sit on the road for like 45 minutes and there was no cars or anything go by. So that'll show you um, in what metropolis that I'm living in. So um, we're gonna talk about making math stick. And right now, um, I find this a bit tricky because I look at the audience to get like feedback and like interactions. Um, and I look for smiles because otherwise 
I'm just picturing everybody sitting there kind of frowning and it makes me think like I'm at my in-laws for a meal. So if you could kind of use the chat box, type in a few comments as we go, um, that'll make your time go by quicker and it'll make the session more interactive. So it's making math stick. Um, here's who I am. I really, really thought no one has, there's quite a few of you that have not seen me before. I was gonna put a picture of um, Jason Momoa in there and see if really anybody would know the difference. Um, but my wife said, if you guys ever did meet me in the future, it'd be kind of a um, kind of a um, shocking realization. I didn't ask her too much more what she meant about that. So we'll just kind of leave it there. So that's me. Um, I live in Prince Edward Island, population of about 150,000. And like Lionel said, um, I've been a classroom teacher, math coach, curriculum consultant, professional lead. Um, and I'm currently acting principal, I think, at one of the best schools in Canada, Greenfield. Um, so um, so kind of why I'm interested in this work. Um, well, <laughs> Jeanette said that she would have told on me had I put Jason in Momoa's picture. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers, but I may be in um, Aquaman 2. But, but just kind of keep that between ourselves. Um, so I've constantly heard and experienced myself as a classroom teacher, the um, a stress that teachers are under in terms of student learning and in terms of instruction. And I really believe this with all my heart, all my heart. Um, I truly believe the teachers are going above and beyond. Um, and why I say that, and you'll see it in the next part, um, I think some of the effort we're putting into our work is not sustainable. Um, I see teachers um, spending countless hours crafting lessons, um, looking through assessments, and um, and they're putting all of their time and effort into um, into their teaching, but they're having, but they're not possibly seeing the end results that they're hoping for. Um, so that's kind of what um, led to the book Making Math a Stick. Um, um, this is a book that I've been thinking about for quite a few years, just about ways that we can work smarter. Um, and maybe not so much harder. And what I'm wanting to share is um, the strategies are effective, manageable, and sustainable. So I'd like to start off every act activity with a math um, question, with a math task. And this is one you can bring back to your class tomorrow, whether it's online or whether it's face-to-face. -face. So I have six squares there. Well, they're really kind of rectangles. Um, so. So I have six, and I want you to place the numbers one to six in the squares so that each number is the difference between the two numbers just below it. So I'll say it again. I want you to put the numbers one to six in these boxes so that the numbers below the number you place is the difference between those two numbers. So if I put one in the top square, then the two numbers below one has to have a difference of one. If I put one in the middle row on the left, then the two farthest left squares on the bottom row have to have a difference of one. So I want you to think about that, and I want you just to try that for a minute or two. What I would usually ask people if we were um, um, if we were face to face is um, how many how many people are finding this task or problem like okay I initially thought I'll just put one two three four five six and that should work and now they're thinking I really don't like this let's move on how many people could see trying this in their classroom. How many people, when they saw this problem, initially thought, well, this is pretty easy. Um, this won't take us long to do. But what? Okay, so this is nice. So I'm seeing that the chat box fill up. Um, what, I'm, what I would encourage people to do when they're saying they're struggling and when they're saying they're having difficulty with this, this is how students feel on a daily basis. And I think it's important that we feel that way too, so that we're not too far out um, from, from the experience of um, our students. And really, what does it mean to struggle through uh, learning? 
So in the presence of time, now I could speak about math all evening and I don't mind right now because my wife is putting my kids to bed. So the longer I talk math, the more I get to avoid um, bedtime routine. So I'm fine with it, but I don't think you would be. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to move on to the next slide for now. And um, and um, uh, this is recorded. And I should say, if you have any questions or if anybody wants a copy of this, um, you, you can send me an email um, with that and we can go from there. So the next slide. This is kind of what's defining our presentation tonight. I want you to think in your head, um, if you've got paper next to you, knock your socks off, you can write it. How would you define learning? What does it mean to learn? And I want you to think about that. Because really, how you define learning really situates how you approach your instruction and what you consider to be successful learning and understanding in the classroom. So I want you to think about that. How would you define learning? So how would you define learning? Because what I want you to do, um, I want you to think about that in your head as we go through the next few um, slides because I, because I want that to situate um, how you would approach that. So what I have here, to, oh, that's what happens when you click twice. Um, what I have here is this is an experience from a primary teacher. So my students spent a lot of time in the fall estimating with a referent. At first, we used concrete objects, but then over time, we moved to pictures. It is now winter, and when I ask students to estimate, my students will count the items and then record that as their estimate. I've tried on many occasions to encourage students to use reference and have shown a picture of a reference beside the items to be estimated. Still, no luck. Now, here is the, here is the um, piece that I'd like you to think about. Why were they able to demonstrate success with estimation using reference in the fall? But now it seems like they've never experienced it. They had it so well, but now they say they don't remember doing it at all. And from an intermediate teacher's perspective, it's a kind of very similar, but just about solving equations in grade eight. So they spent a lot of time on solving equations. At the end of the unit, students could solve equations involving a single variable. Um, I assessed students and determined they could isolate a variable, whether it was added, subtracted, multiplied, or divided. Now, after March break, students cannot isolate the variable if it's multiplied or divided with another number. In fact, much of the class is saying this is hard and that they need step-by-step -step support when working on such equations. Where did all their success um, earlier in the year go? I thought they had understood what to do. So if you're in elementary, you probably address place value at the beginning of the year. So think about this next example with place value. At the start of the year, we did place value with whole numbers. Then we got into working with decimals. It was the same as whole numbers, only we were using decimals. I did great with expanded form, standard form, and writing numbers in words, but that was at the beginning of the year. Before the second report card, my teacher gave us some questions on decimals. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't remember to put the and in for the decimal, and I forgot the place value names of the numbers to the right of the decimal. I usually get all the questions right in class, but I didn't this time. The teacher would review the concept with everyone before giving us the questions. So do those things sound familiar? What we've what we see is that when we're going over a concept with students, whether it's, it is after a review or whether it's actually during that focal point in the year, we see students demonstrating um, understanding or um, having success with uh, assessments. But if we come back to that later in the year, it is this common thing, I forgot, or we didn't do fractions last year, says a grade six teacher. Um, no, sorry, uh, tongue tied, says a grade six student but they would have done fractions earlier in the year and in grade five. So, so this is my, this is kind of what I want to suggest. Um, I think teachers are doing an amazing job with teaching. Um, but I think when we're putting in all that effort, we're not seeing the value added that we deserve to see or that students should be uh, showing. So what I want to suggest in this book, um, 
what I want to suggest is that there's simple, sustainable, effective ways we can make little tweaks in our teaching and we'll see such, such a um, impact on student uh, learning. Because I think how we've taught in the past is that what learning tends to focus on is getting things into the heads of students. We tend to think about, okay, I'm doing place value, so I'm gonna teach about place value or I'm going to give students questions on it. We're gonna talk about, about it because I went to a PD session one time and they said talk is important in math and it is. Um, and we're going to really hone in on these. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to give uh, students then opportunities to actually um, demonstrate their understanding of this. And what we tend to do is we tend to have a year set up in a, a linear way. We tend to have topic A, and that topic A, let's say, could be, um, could be improper fractions. We teach that, we do well, students are getting it, we leave the classroom kind of with some great posture, looking up, um, and then we go to topic B, and then we go to topic C. But it's very much linear. And, and even kind of taking that one step further. Okay, so I'm pretty impressed with this. Um, did you see how I kept everything on the same slide, but I just removed the uh, visuals? I was pretty impressed with that. I was pretty impressed with how it's seamless. It really is two slides, but it has the appearance of one slide just with a different picture. Anyway, I was pretty pleased with that. Um, and when we're teaching, it's kind of look at something like this. When we do lesson topic A, and it's kind of like practice questions and corresponding focus, um, and all the practice questions deal with topic A, and that could be um, representing improper fractions. Then what we have is lesson topic B, practice questions and that all addressing topic B, and that could be um, ordering integers, and everything comes with lesson topic B. And then we have lesson topic C, which could be finding surface area. But all of the practice questions deal with um, topic C. <clears throat> and what this is, when we do this, we are programming, and I'm going to use that word, we're programming our students to just not have to think about what is going on in this problem or what concept is being explored or um, what strategy do I have to apply? Because if I spent a week on um, on um, representing improper fractions, and if all the questions are on that, I can just go through that ropely. Um, and I think that's leading to our issues. Now, people say, tell me more, David, tell me more. Um, I'm just sitting back and I can be here all night. Well, the question is, why do we have this focus? Why is this focus so prevalent? And there's three reasons to it. And there could be more um, our reasons, but here are three. A, teachers are provided with a curriculum and feel pressure to move through it at a brisk pace to ensure that all content is covered. And I italicize covered. So we're trying to get everything covered. Once again, when I think of covered, I think we're trying to get everything into the heads of um, a student. Um, possible focus reason why number two, classrooms as assessments typically measure students' ability on the content that has just been covered. So what this does is this assesses student knowledge and understanding on a short-term basis. Um, and then three, students are required to take a standardized assessment. To ensure students do well on these assessments, teachers teach to the test. It's about getting material into the student's head. And, and these are all reasons. When I've been um, working with different schools and teachers and associations um, across Canada and the states, these reasons are um, echoed by many. I've never heard a teacher say, do you know what I have a lot of? It's time during the day. I have about 45 minutes during the day that I'm not quite sure what to do with. If you can find me a few additional math concepts, David, I could put them in there and that could really fill my day. No, instead, teachers are feeling overwhelmed um, and they're feeling that time pressure in to get everything done. And what we, what we can take away from this approach to um, uh, learning, now you'll see kind of, a little assessment to the right, something similar that I'm thinking we would have seen. 
growing up. Um, but I just kind of want to give this an example. Um, so, so a person I know, um, when she was in grade nine, she took home a um, uh, fractions test. Um, and she was telling me, she said, look at this. I got 112% on a fraction test, which <laughs> is completely ironic, the 112%. Anyway, um, but I'm thinking, okay. Um, I said, so what, what was your test on? She said, well, um, we were doing multiplication we were doing multiplication of um of fractions and there was like 20, 25 problems, like one ninth multiplied by two thirds, da da da. And then there was a word problem at the bottom. And it was like um Vancouver Island is one seventh the size of uh, British Columbia, and British Columbia is one tenth the size of Canada. What is Vancouver Island in relation to Canada? And she got it correct. She did one then one seventh multiplied by one tenth. And I said, wow, you know this. Um, I said, how did you know that? She said, well, right below my name, it said multiplication. Um, the first 20 problems, they gave me two fractions and I multiplied. She said, and there was two fractions in the um, word problem. So I just looked at the two fractions, pulled the two fractions out, multiplied them. Um, I said, oh, um, I said, um, so you didn't even read the problem? She said, no, didn't have to. I said, okay, what would you have done if there would have been an addition question instead of multiplication? She said, uh, that wouldn't be on a multiplication test. I, I said, okay, so then so then this might be a, um, a troubling area that you have with fractions. She said, I've got a test with 112% written on it that would disagree with you right now. She said, obviously, I know fractions and I know them well. So what I think we have is we have something called an illusion of mastery. When we have this teach, test, and move on approach, um, this uh, linear approach, um, a student can demonstrate success on the assessment, and that gives them the impression that they understand the concepts. Um, however, what we need to understand is sometimes we're not measuring understanding. What we're measuring is short-term performance, and there, there's a difference. If it's only uh, linear and we're only measuring that short-term performance, it's giving students an inaccurate um, depiction of their understanding. And then what we have is we have retention and application. My question for people would be, are students retaining their understanding and are they able to apply previous learning to solve novel situations so think about that in your class and this is a big question are students retaining what they understand and can they apply previous learning to solve current problems now i get told well david you know that's really not fair before i give them a problem that addresses a concept we haven't done in a while i am going to re to review that with them but are we really reviewing or are we cramming it back into short term performance again so the students are being programmed okay so i just had a practice session on surface area so this next question is how i do surface area think about before a provincial or a state exam Think about this, um, how many times do we stop addressing new concepts a few weeks before the assessment only to, and I'm doing quotes in my hand, air quotes, even though you can't see them. Technically, I'm not really doing it, but I want you to have the impression that I'm doing it. Um, how many times do we do that and we call it review? And are we reviewing or are we cramming? It's something similar to when we went through when we went through university or when we went through high school, what would we do the night before a, um, a midterm or the night before the final exam? We would study, we would cram it in, and we would, hopefully that we're all here today, we would do well on that exam, but did we really understand it? Or did we just um, get a passing grade on it? And that would indicate su um, success, which leads me to my next question. Does does success really indicate understanding? And I'll say, I don't think it does on um, some of our um, assessments. So this is kind of shifting our view of what learning is. 
So what I want you to think about is a broadened view of um, uh, learning. Now, this is, now you probably won't be able to get to sleep tonight because you're going to be thinking about this all night. So I'm just warning you right now, this should have been a disclaimer at the beginning. You know, may not be able to sleep tonight because you're still thinking about this. But I want you to think about this definition of learning in comparison to the definition of learning you had at the beginning. Learning is the acquisition of knowledge and skills and having these readily available from memory to support meaning making opportunities. So learning is the acquisition of knowledge and skills and having these readily available from memory to support future making meaning opportunities. So I'm going to ask you just a question. In your definition of learning, how many of you thought about are students able to recall and apply previous learning? Are students able to demonstrate their understanding by, by recall calling a concept they've explored earlier? Or do students need the scaffolded support of having you walk through them to outline what the strategy is? So, so then this is a big thing. This, making math uh, stick, um, this is, th this is the whole making math stick part. What can we do in the class and what are some instructional strategies and learning strategies for students that we can bring into the class or highlight in the class from the student perspective that really supports students understanding and being able to re recall that understanding. So that that's it. So it's readily available from memory to support future meaning making opportunities. So we can take our previous learning and we can apply that to solve future meaning making. So we're not always starting from scratch. Um, so and just to kind of give you kind of like some of um, the um, um, scientific cognitive terms, um, which um, which I think is important. So when we come back to that broadened definition of um, all learning, there's really three stages of it. There's encoding, which means pretty much getting knowledge into our heads. We still need students. Um, to acquire knowledge, to acquire, um, yeah, knowledge, skills, facts into their head. And then once it's in there, the next step or the next stage is the consolidation. That's where meaning is assigned to that knowledge. That's where, that's which gets it into our memory. So the encoding part, getting it into our heads and getting that knowledge in, but it's through the consolidation that we make me meaning with that. And, it, and that consolidation is when um, connections are established between previous understanding and with the new um, uh, knowledge coming in. So we're building that network and we're, and we're making meaning and assigning meaning to this new knowledge. And the retrieval, the retrieval means getting knowledge out of our heads. So I'm going to argue well, not argue. That sounds really harsh. And it's only Tuesday. And I don't know about everyone here, but it's April 27th, which makes me think the year went by quickly. But then I really think, sweet mother of pearl, it's only April 27th. And then we have the retrieval part. So I think we do a really good job on encoding and on consolidation. But I think retrieval is something we can do better with. And the cool thing with retrieval, it's about getting knowledge out of our heads. It's about, I'm seeing 43 teaching days left. Um, and with only one exclamation point, good for you. I would have thought that would have got two or three. Um, what do you call it? Um, so it means getting information out of our head. It's about reaching back and bringing something we previously learned into mind. So we're just not storing it and filing it away, never to be seen again. We're really using retrieval as a way to help us make sense of current situations by being able to apply previous learning. And here's an example briefly. So let's think about the double-double multiplicative strategy, seven times four, seven groups of four. Um, 
So use 7 multiplied by 2 to find the product of 14 and then add 14 and 14, the double 14, to find 28. So instruction focusing solely on teaching, the double double strategy represents the encoding state. So if I'm talking about modeling, highlighting students, okay, how do we find how do we apply this double double strategy? Oh, it's nine times four. Okay. Nine by two, 18 plus nine by two, 18, 18 and 18, 36. But we have to go beyond that. And the consolidation stage takes us one step further where they have to, where they can find similarities and differences between the double-double strategy and the double strategy, or the clock facts, or the nifty nine. So what that consolidation does is it really strengthens all four strategies. But here's the part. We have to then incorporate retrieval. We have to provide students with opportunities to practice selecting suitable, um, suitable strategies to solve a problem. So one example, and I'm just giving this example, give students some problems and ask them to put a um, circle around the ones that they use a double strategy, place a square around the ones they'd use a clock fax, and a triangle around ones that they'd use the nifty nine. So really doing an exercise like, like that, students have to discriminate which strategy to use and on what problem, and then what you're doing is you're seeing for yourself how they are applying those different strategies. And the students are really engaged in, um, in a um, retrieval opportunity to help that. And retrieval provides students with the opportunity to make more connections to past learning. So just a little bit of cognitive science jargon, because I don't think anybody wants to go to bed without thinking about cognitive science tonight but it kind of gives the evidence base for the work. So revisiting concepts throughout the year can be a game changer. So the cognitive science jargon would be each time a memory is retrieved, the individual must think about it once again, reconstruct it in terms of the previous knowledge and current experience, and then reconsolidate it. So during that, our memory strengthen. And the more that we retrieve um, previous learning, the more our brain organizes it. Um, so by strengthening the pathways to these memories and increasing the retrieval cues, the brain naturally makes these memories more accessible. Therefore, it can be argued that retrieval is more powerful than encoding. So it's almost like we're, we're kind of missing that third stage that actually has a greater impact on student learning than on the encoding phase. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, David, I am signing up. I am buying one of my books for all my um, a school, possibly board, possibly I'm buying this for my uh, spouse for our wedding anniversary. So how can I retrieve these things? So here are just, just some little approaches that we can support retrieving after a concept has been introduce. We can space out opportunity with that. So instead of just going over a concept for one short block of time, spread that concept out to maybe a day here or a day there. Spread it out over time so the students have to return to the content and they're interrupting the forgetting process. And mixed practice, instead of having all the same concepts addressed in a practice session, um, offer problems that that address a different strategy. So students have to read the problem, um, understand what's being asked, discriminate which strategy to apply, and then to apply that. Um, and when problem types come in random order, a student must first think about the problem and determine the necessary strategy. And feedback. This is a big part. Important for students to recognize whether they're correct or they're incorrect. This supports metacognition, and this comes back to the illusion of mastery or the illusion of um, a learning um, or an inaccurate um, metacog an inaccurate depiction of our accuracy. Um, we don't um, uh, students don't always need to receive feedback from the teacher. Students can work through a problem and then check their work against a um, 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 answer key against other students' work against a completed solution. Um, 
or that feedback doesn't always have to come back from the teacher. And it doesn't have to be immediate, but what it has to do is it has to provide students with the recognition whether they're correct or not. And here would be an example. So the first block considered block practice, that's how we traditionally approach practice after the concept was introduced. We have a practice session on A, a practice session on B, one on C, one on D. And I would see those before a standardized exam or a midterm or a test. But what I'm advocating for is instead of having block practice, consider how we would approach retrieval after a concept was introduced using space and mixed practice. In the first um, session, practice session, we address all four concepts, A, B, C, and D. So the students have to discriminate through the problems and understand which strategy to apply. And then the next session, they're still doing A, B, C, and D, but now the problems are mixed up in different order. And C, B, D, A, and then D, A, B, C. <clears throat> um, what I think that that does, well, it is not what I think that does. What that does is you're constantly returning to a concept over time. So, so students are constantly getting practice, bringing previous learning to the forefront. And that makes a big difference. So what I've done is we've kind of talked about how, how we need to broaden our understanding of um, our learning. Um, yes, lagging homework too. And do you know what, um, Alex? Um, that was going to be uh, one of the things um, one of the things that I have here, um, but it was, but the session um, just kind of, um, I don't have enough uh, time, but I will uh, talk about homework during the instructional strategies. So what I have is I have four strategies as an example for each of the um, learning strategies and instructional strategies. And these are all taken from the book, which I don't know about you, but I'm hearing amazing things about making math uh, stick. And I hear that the author it's just amazing. Anyway, feel free to comment in the chat box. So learning strategy one, compare and contrast. What this is, is that when, when um, a students compare and contrast two concepts, it requires the students to examine each of the concepts closely and to distinguish their similarities and differences. By doing that, students have to hone in on the foundational aspect of both concepts, thereby adding crucial layer of meaning to the student's memories. So you're really adding to that network. And an example of that could be compare and contrast continuous and discrete data. So let's say you did continuous and discrete data before Christmas. Why not, why not provide them an opportunity to retrieve and say, okay, boys and girls, Compare and contrast continuous and discrete data. Or if you're teaching, um, you could do this in grades three, four. Compare and contrast area and perimeter. Or compare and contrast scatter plots and circle graphs. So after you've worked with the concept, this is a way to come back to it as a way to support that understanding. Venn diagrams work well with this. Um, something else is dual coding, learning strategy two. So dual, um, so then dual coding has a lot of um, uh, learning theory, cognitive science supporting it, saying that when we when we dual code, when we combine text and visual, um, research um, uh, states that students learn better, and because each part of the brain is a different spot for vision, for um, uh, visuals and um, a text. Um, so then what that does is it really kind of has has the has two parts working towards that into creating a much more comprehensive understanding of the concept. So you can do use both words and visuals to describe the expression 5C subtract 2, or use both words and visuals to describe the translation of 3 to the left, or use both words and visuals to describe an array. Um, and that could be, I see a lot of people using placemat, uh, placemats. You could put a concept in the middle and on the left side, have them describe it using words and have them describe it using visuals. And what you can do is then students can share that or you can use that to identify learning goals for the group um, so that you can see who needs support explaining it visually and who needs support explaining it um, using text. 
And it's a great way if you're on um, a line uh, learning or face-to-face -to, -face to really work through that. The free write. Free write is meant to be a writing to learn um, a strategy. And it's about the students brainstorming about a topic and writing everything they can tell you about a concept or a strategy. And it's without judgment. So there's no critiquing. It is really a learning strategy for the um, a student to really organize their thinking, revise their thoughts, all the while strengthening their connections to this. So let's say you did, um, let's say you did um, multiplication before Christmas and you talked about um, using equal groups. Okay, what can you tell me about multiplication? What can you tell me about transformations? What can you tell me about surface area? And you would give them a time to do that depending on their age, five, 10, 15 um, 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 minutes. But to take that one step further, instead of just free write, think of learning strategy number four, um, 30 words or less. So for here, we're introducing a cap on the number of words and we're giving them a time to do it. But the only difference is, is that 30 words or less gives them the cap, whereas free write doesn't. And by introducing this cap, students need to be more focused on choosing the most crucial information. They need to be concise in what they write and to structure their information in an organized format so as to avoid exceeding the word count cap. And this will show you how important this concept is. Over the weekend, um, my wife and I were um, uh, driving. I don't know where we were going. It must be to buy groceries. That is really the highlight. That is um, our date day. Um, so, so then we were doing that and she asked me something about my book. So I was telling her and she said, you know what? This is a great time for you to practice what you uh, wrote. I don't want you just to do, give me a free uh, write. I want it in 30 words or less so that we can move on. I'm like, ouch, that's not the intent of this strategy. But mine but mean oh well it does have applications in real life i guess um so then what we have now is we're going into an instructional strategy daily cumulative review if i can share one thing with you give this a chance um i've seen this transform the way um uh, schools approach learning approach review um, approach retrieval practice um um, I've, I've seen this to be a game changer for some uh, schools. And then what it is, is it, it, it takes about five to 10 minutes and you give student, you give three to four questions and they're brief questions. They're not meant to be in-depth problem solving tasks. What it is, you identify key concepts and you have um, um, uh, students do, um, do like one question on, on um, each of the concepts. So there's four different concepts, four different questions. You give them five minutes to do it, then you um, then you share what the correct response is, is, and that gives them the feedback whether they're correct or I'm not. And I see Jeanette in the chat box. Yeah, Muscadabit Valley loves DCR. Um, I did some work with them, and it and um, and it makes a big difference. And it's one of those subtle things that you can do in the warm up. Um, and here are some examples. Um, so you will see the left is a primary teacher's example. Um, what the primary teacher chose was um, was four key concepts, place value, perimeter, subtraction, and equations. And there was four questions every day, um, and they were mixed up. So the teacher gave those four questions, gave about five minutes to um, uh, solve them, and then would um, uh, check it. And on the right side, it's an elementary example. The teacher identified fractions, place value, decimals, and multiplication. And what this does now, I have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Some teachers don't do this every weekday. Um, some teachers do it every second day. Some teachers do it and they call it kind of like um, they do it on Wednesdays and um, uh, Fridays. But the point is, is that they continuously come back to it and they space it out so that it is meant to be a way to keep that retrieval going up. So that would be daily cumulative review. Um, Strategy two would be a choice board. A choice board is a visual presentation of multiple questions or prompts that address one or more concepts. Students have the choice of which of these problems to do. And now some of it might be that you might say, I want you to choose a question from the top row, one from the second row, one from the 
third row, or I want one from each different column, or I want you to um, do a diagonal and it's up to um, you. But what it is, is that students have to come back to this. So let's say that you did fractions earlier in the um, year. An example might be, here's a choice board for fractions um, that you would give down the road so that students are coming back to these concepts. And this could be a whole class um, example. Um, this could be something that could be as simple as um, that, that you have a few different choice boards up and students can work on it individually. But it's meant to be previous learning um, in a way that um, uh, students can come back to it over time. Okay, um, next is kind of a then now later grid. It's a great way to address different concepts to mix your review, but to space it over time, because um, what it does is the then previous learning, now current concepts and begin to explore concepts identified for the near future. Um, and there's three questions for each. Um, and the grid is a form of retrieval practice so that students address a variety of concepts of concepts and they work on it over con uh, consecutive weeks so they're spacing out all learning so what it could look like would be there's a then now later grid from intermediate the top one was um integers adding and subtraction of um integers the next one was adding and subtraction of fractions and the last one was a um, multiplication of um whole numbers and um, uh, decimal numbers. So we have that, so that's another one. And you can put the, that as a class example, um, individual. Um, and the last one is, um, now I know that, that there's some schools that have flexibility in crafting their year plan, um, that there's some districts that do, but there's really two ways that I share in the book that we can think about the year plan. One is a spiral curriculum where we think of concepts in terms of big ideas and we really cycle through them, let's say three times a year. Um, so the first cycle is that we kind of get our feet wet, that we work through it. Then when we come back to it during like uh, cycle two, we delve a little bit deeper into it. So we're spacing it out through the uh, year um, and students are coming in with their previous understanding. And then in that third cycle, we're really um, digging down deeply in that so they can apply their previous learning. Um, and then what it does is it is spacing concepts out over time and it's mixing concepts throughout the uh, year. Now, I will tell you, one of the things is people say, I don't have time to address a concept three different times during the uh, year. I've seen spiral curriculums, teachers who have used them and come back to them will say, I actually have more time doing it this way. And I feel like I'm not just covering concepts, but I'm actually focusing on student um, um, all learning. And the other one could be a key concept, which you would identify either at your grade level, at your school or in the district, the key concepts, and you would prioritize those in the um, in the year plan to have those front uh, loaded in the year plan. So then what that does is that gives you more time with the key concepts as those key concepts are crucial and it helps with the learning of the other curriculum outcomes and um, uh, standards. So it really helps with that. Um, and the other in, in um, a instructional strategy that's not on here um, is um, homework. Um, I've seen the different strategies being uh, used. Um, I've seen one, one um, a teacher in the past, what she did was she would give um, one problem on the current concept and she would give two or three problems from a previous concept as a way to kind of pull it forward. And then she would give one concept, one um, a question that actually would dig down deeper as a problem solving approach. So it was giving students multiple concepts to work on, but it was not giving them too much that they weren't getting the feedback of if they were correct or I'm not. Um, what? Okay, so I'm pretty pumped. Everybody stand up, stretch, but still uh, listen, okay? I'm pretty pumped about this. Um, I've been working um, the past few weeks on um, making a website, and I tried to contact a few people, but everybody's busy. So I'm like, well, how hard can it be to build your own a website? Sweet mother of pearl. 
it's hard to build your own website. I don't know if you guys know that, but when you try to get into plugins, widgets, appearance, um, uh, customization, it's pretty tricky. It's really fun, but it's pretty tricky. And fun being a stretch of the word. So what I've done is I've um, I crafted um, a web page. Um, and if you go there, um, I'll have instructional videos. Um, I am committing to doing a blog and I'm committing to kind of posting like a problem of the week slash problem solving thing that you can take to your classroom immediately. And then what I've done with this one this week, if you go to the website, you will see that I gave prompts that you can take back to the class tomorrow. And I actually broke it down into here's a primary example, here's an elementary example, and here's an intermediate example. Um, so that so that it'll show you how this this concept is, or um, a strategy can be applied. Um, and I just kind of want to say, if you go to the bottom of the page, um, there's a subscribe now button with that. And then um, what that does, anytime I post like problems of the week on there, or um, or um, or like um videos or like takeaways, um, you would immediately get that um you would immediately get an email with that because I know how busy. So it's called like instructional takeaways. If you go to the bottom, sign up and I promise not to spam you. Um, or um, there's on there, um, I'm a, I will be doing a blog. Um, there's a link to the books that I've uh, written. Um, I, I kind of provide what are some options of, web, of um, workshops and um, presentations. And there's a contact me. What I'd love to do is um, I would love to have this interactive. So if people um, if people wanted to like um, if people had questions about a concept or would love to see me write about a particular concept or or post a video, um, if you could share that information, that would become topics that I would do so that you could bring back to the classroom. Um, something else that I want to commit to is um, um, I know um, I know teachers time is um, really crucial if you're interested in like um, brief PDs like like short a few minute PDs um, webinars um, I, then um, then what you could do is um, contact me give me an idea and we could craft like a 20 to 30 minute targeted webinar for that or an um, hour Angeli um, Angela, is it okay if I post your blog to my blog roll? Yes, definitely. Anyway, spread the word. I'm pretty pumped about it. Subscribe, visit, share with it. Um, uh, from what I've been told, this uh, logo would make a great tattoo. Not quite sure. Um, um, what, what we have next is just here is the book and where it came from. And everyone, there's my contact information. You can email me. Um, oh, and it's 8.59. I'm getting under the wire, Lionel, even though we had tech difficulties. Um, there's my email. There's my Twitter feed. I'm on Facebook, which I'm just figuring out what Facebook is. Not going to lie to you guys. It's a whole new world out there. And I'm not sure if I'm even got my own page or group or post or friends or suggest. And um, there's my uh, website. Everyone, thank you so much. And I'm going to stop talking. David, that was great. Thank you very much. I, uh, there's a, a couple people uh, sort of commenting on your message and, and to keep that message going. And, and I have to agree. Um, I really like sort of the focus you take on the learning. And I'm just wondering, I know we're coming right to the end and we did start a couple minutes late because of tech technical difficulties, but you start with that definition of learning, and I'm not sure that's the first thing that would pop into teachers' heads right off the bat. You know, we can recognize it and we can we know it when it's happening, but you seem to dig a little bit deeper. And, uh, and then when you talk about sort of the three steps and get to retrieval, um, that's not recall, right? Like when you're talking about retrieval, the, the learning strategies you gave, I mean, you're talking about hard work for kids. You know, if they've yep. got to go back, it, two or three months and what did we do there again? But isn't that what learning is at that point? Is that the learning is that they have to retrieve that and represent it in, in making new meaning? Yeah, um, because um, I think so many times, like I was saying, um, our instruction and what students view as learning is, how much stuff can I get into my head? How much things can I, can I, can I um, talk about? 
but we need to support students in really thinking about, okay, how do I support my understanding of the things that's already in there and how do I make them stronger? And really, how can I have those readily available to use when I'm solving current problems right now? Because um, I think so many times we spend all this time and effort as do us students with concepts over time, but we don't support them and then having them be able to um, pull it back out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. It's uh, and obviously I'm I'm probably a little biased because I sort of come from the senior physics zone, and uh, you know, and but so when I'm you know things do start to just naturally in nature cross over, so you need that, and you need to be able to pull on that. So, as Blanche says, it's uh, you know, some of the ideas and make it stick. That that how learning occurs is uh is powerful at, at all grades and i really like the practical examples you gave in there and that's being reflected as the as the chat is moving a, along here as as we chat uh, talk so um david uh, just on behalf of everyone i'll uh, i'll i'll lead thank you for this last hour i'll let you uh, lead us take us out with the last word but thanks for taking the time and uh, you can see from the comments people said where did the hour go it really did it was very enjoyable and for folks uh, if you click on the handouts tab uh, you can see that there's a you can get to Pembroke Publishers and there's a code there. Uh, if you'd like to use that, you can get five dollars off when you order David's book. Um, and the code is MMS21. So, David, again, thank you. And I'll just let you uh, take us out tonight. Do you know what? If I had a bit more musical talent, I would be uh, singing. Looks like we made it, but I can't. <laughs> um, and just in case anyone's planning to really uh, Google me, I didn't play professional hockey under my name. I played under, no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, everyone, thank you so, so much for this time. Um, and I want to thank uh, Pembroke Publishers for um, uh, bringing this book to uh, life uh, for me. Uh, Lionel, thank you for for uh, problem solving our tech support through this, because I know that my Wi-Fi speed, I don't think even are registered on the uh, meter at the beginning. Um, and uh, really everyone, um, what I want to stress is reach out at any time. You can reach out through my contact information here or on the website, um, I'm here to support. Um, and I want to help you have an approach to instruction that is both effective and sustainable. Anyway, that's everything for me. Good. Thanks again, David. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time. Have a good evening.